Once upon a time, I used to work as a tour guide at the Theresienstadt concentration camp. On the 8 a.m. bus ride between Prague and Theresien, I would have an hour to discuss history with my sleepy and occasionally hungover tourists. I started off by quoting Maria Theresa's eerily familiar 18th century rambles about the empire's jewelry, and then I'd go for the eerily familiar rise of Hitler to the eerily familiar notes of Sudetenland to that war we all learned about in school. People would wake up. The buses, suspension, and the face of Prague's cobbled streets would make sure of that. But aside from the story of how the brain behind the Holocaust got assassinated by two guys on bicycles, the tourists' faces stayed tired. It's an eerily familiar wheel. The names and details change, but the direction never does. We go from one event to the other, slowly descending with lies and blood of the innocent and carnage, and then when nothing is left but the rubble and survivors, we say never again and begin our descent once more. The rich will always send the poor to die in wars. The corrupt will always find their scapegoats, and any victories of our fight for humanity are temporary ones. The wheel of history keeps on spinning and its rotations are eerily familiar. It's not a pleasant reminder to wake up to, especially not on a microbus. The tourists would walk by the memorial and be taken to the small fortress and handed off to a local guide. I'd shadow the tour on the off chance that any of my people would get lost or needed someone to walk past the more claustrophobic aspects of the tour. I'd listen to the same stories I've heard a thousand times. The tour guide would describe how the heating in the prison worked and then tell us how it was never turned on. The tour guide would point to the doctor's office and say how it wasn't worth much without supplies. We would walk through the showers and the tour guide would tell us about how the delousing machine never worked. And if someone asked, quietly, whether gas came from the shower heads, the tour guide would say no. That is, Instadt was a propaganda camp. It was shown through Red Cross to illustrate how well the Jews are being treated by the Reich. The showers didn't spew poison, but the old and young and sick and starving still died. 88,000 of the inhabitants were sent off to their death in Auschwitz, but 33,000 died of the orchestrated conditions of the Theresienstadt itself. Man's cruelty to man. We can't be trusted. The deranged will always take the wheel and keep it spinning. There will be blood. There will be suffering. And when the war is done, our victories will be temporary. The tourists would walk through the tunnels built by the emperor who emancipated the Jews, exit at the execution range, walk by a shining statue of the starving, and finally settle in the cinema built for Nazi entertainment. They'd watch a film. A film which me and my colleagues fought to replace the 20-minute documentary on the camp which was previous company policy. Instead of the documentary, the tourists would get a 10-minute collage. Instead of the bone-dry retelling of the same story they heard on the bus, they would see the films the Nazis made. They would see the soccer games, the farms, the functioning showers. In all the languages of Europe, the inmates would read the I'm all right in Terezin as the Fuhrer's shining gift to the Jews would flicker on the screen. Then the wailing songs of Auschwitz and Birkenau and Treblinka would take control and the Nazi propaganda would fade away and the drawings of the inmates would take the screens. Crowds. Crowds of the sick and the starving and the frail and the mountains of the dead. We fought for the propaganda film to be shown because it was shorter. And it gave us more time to discuss the things that needed to be discussed. But we also fought for the propaganda film to be shown because it illustrated what the documentary could not. It showed the lie. That eerily familiar lie that everything is well and that there are no monsters here. It showed the lie and then the nauseating truth that only becomes eerily familiar in the aftermath. We fought with our company for the film and we won, but I rarely sat with the tourists to watch it. This was my job. 
I worked for years. Sometimes in a summer high season, I would go to Terezin three times a week, sitting there in Groundhog's Day, watching the horror of the wheel turn over and over, letting it become just a place where I can be found at 10 a.m. on a Monday. I didn't have the fortitude for that. Instead, I would usher the tourists into the cinema and explain my absence, and they would weakly smile and nod in a knowing way, and then I would leave them in the dark. Instead of watching Nazi propaganda, I would stand outside with the custodian of the cinema. Workers in the Czech tourism ministry are seldom chipper. When we're at work, we're cloudy people who just want the time to pass. The custodian seemed to come of completely different blood. He was a chatty man in his late 50s with a little mustache and he didn't make fun of my broken Czech. Sometimes he would complain about the groups of high school students that chant and holler while they're taught about the crimes of man. Sometimes he would try to predict Terezin's groomy skies. And sometimes, when the groups were small and no calls would come in for reservations, he would tell me of his life in communist Czechoslovakia. He'd tell me the echoes of the tales of stories I've heard from my parents and the rest of my blood. Tales of totality dampened by casual acquaintance. The strife was implied. The stories forced the absurdity of the system into the spotlight. It was comical. For 40 years, the people just had to deal with it. They were small and caught in a game much bigger than any game they played before. For individuals, the scent was punished by deprivation. For the crowds, there were rubber batons. And if the system itself tried to don a human face in the shade of that terrible game, tanks were brought in as peacekeepers. Beneath the boot of totalitarianism, there were still people. There were still men and women that had somehow managed to live a life. I was not there. I was born into freedom. I was born into freedom and I cannot begin to comprehend how unfair life can be in the shade of that terrible game. The cinema custodian would tell me the echoes of the stories I've heard all my life and we would laugh at the absurdity of it all and then, drifting off the high of being spared what he experienced, I would say, thank God that ended. Yes, he would reply, and then that eerily familiar wheel would turn. But. They say that when a Czech comes back from vacation and his co-workers ask how his trip has been, whatever compliments there are to be paid have to be nestled in between complaints to retain politeness. We complain to each other. It's how we communicate. Or at least that's what I would tell myself whenever politics entered the room. Every thank God we're free now was followed by a but which was followed by a recognition of that eerily familiar wheel. The Botox are in the East, the culture war in the West, the corruption and slide towards something dark in our own midst. We were still nestled somewhere in the shadow of that terrible wheel and it would spin on regardless of what we had to say. Once ten minutes had passed, we would part, usually reminding ourselves that at least, for the time being, we are free. I've avoided the propaganda film so that its suffering would not become mundane. Yet daily repetition of my job, that need to stay on schedule and compartmentalize my place of work resulted in one quiet compromise. The last three notes of the wailing song, like the chimes of the Prague subway doors in reverse, sung in a tortured tenor that sounded familiar with the name. For years, I would press my ear against the cinema door erected 80 years prior and listen to the final notes of that horrid music. Tre, blin, ka. Then I take a breath, open the door, and apologize to the tourists that there won't be a chance to see the cinema's propaganda museum because we have a schedule to keep. If anyone needed to use the bathroom or grab a coffee, that would be available by the exits of the cinema. I would meet them outside. Some would defiantly dawdle through the museum. Some would go for the terrible coffee machine, but most would just follow me outside. We'd always stand beneath the chestnut tree, 
Even if the tree bore fruits and pelted us beneath, we'd stand beneath the chestnut tree and wait for the rest of the tour to filter out of the cinema. I've stood beneath that tree for years, silently counting and recounting, making sure no one got lost in the political prison, but I would never count long. Someone always comes. From the crowd of waiting foreigners, someone always comes and starts to chat. They mention other concentration camps. They mention other genocide. They mention other crimes of man, and we sigh. The Belgians, the Germans, the Russians, the Americans, the Chinese. I've stood beneath that tree for years and sighed with more than I could remember. Sometimes, that was the end of it. We'd sigh, and then, realizing that the group was caffeinated and whole, I would count them one more time and bring them back to the bus so they could see the place where the Jews were trapped. But not always. Sometimes the Poles, the Indians, the Israelis would have their own stories to share. Most, like the custodians, were stories emphasizing the bizarre. Stories where the description of that ever-present wheel were laughably insane. Some spoke of themselves, some brought the tales down for their ancestry, but the ending was always the same. I would stand beneath the chestnut tree, count recount, and take them back to the bus. On the way to the town of Terezin, I would tell them the stories of Friedel Dicker Brande, who collected the drawings of the camp's children so that they would be remembered, of Kurt Garand's conduct on set as he was forced to create propaganda for the Reich. As we would make our way to the town of Terezin, I would tell them stories of people who overcame their circumstances and shine bright before their lives were snuffed out. I would mention them again at the end of the tour as we would ride back to Prague, suggesting it is the strength of human spirit that we should contemplate on the quiet road back. They must be remembered, I would say into the bus microphone that scarcely worked. They must be remembered so that these crimes against man can never happen again. But we all knew that the wheel would not stop. There were other concentration camps, there were other genocides, there were other crimes being committed right as the wheels of that microbus turned. After the cinema, in a town of Terezin, I would take them to the municipal school that had become a Holocaust museum. I would show them the room covered in dead children's names and then show them the dead children's arts and then... When those that were looking for their ancestry were done reading the walls, I would tell the group that the rest of the museum is theirs to see. They do not need me behind them, telling them what is sad and what is not. They had 30 minutes to spend among evidence of man's inhumanity, and then we had to get back to the bus to see the crematorium. They would weakly smile and nod. They understood 30 minutes. For 30 minutes multiplied by a hundred pay stubs, I roamed the Museum of the Holocaust awaiting a bus. I would move among the clientele, occasionally asking if they had any questions or if they wanted to hear about something specific on the bus ride back to Prague. Regardless of race or creed or gender, the replies were nearly uniform as if the words were hardwired into every culture. No thank you. They would say, it's a lot to process. During those 30 minutes that stretch out into days and months, I would always have three stops. Two were for my own good, to keep the apathy at bay. The last was to my own detriment. Near the stairs that lead up to the second floor of the museum, there is a drawing. A drawing of a pig and a duck, and the duck has four legs. If I count up the seconds over the years, I've spent hours with that drawing. On the bad days, when the sky was gray and my heart felt unwell, that was a drawing drawn by a little girl that had never seen a duck. A life cut short before even the mundane can kick in. On sunny summer days, that picture was drawn by a little girl that was goofy, that was aware that ducks only have two feet. On the good days that drawing came from a defiant imagination that raged against the rules of conduct which the world tried to impose on it. On all days, 
Regardless of how I felt, however, that was a drawing of a child that died in Auschwitz. And until that drawing turns to dust, that's what it will always be. My second stop would always be on the second floor, in the memorabilia room. The exhibit showing the identification papers which the guards forced the prisoners to carry. Beneath the plexiglass, partially covered up by other papers, there's a passport photo of a man, a Jew, with an eerily familiar toothbrush mustache and combed over hair. It's not a striking likeness, but to me the similarity seems intentional. There's another passport covering the name of that man, making him a complete mystery to me. If you count up the seconds over the years, I've spent hours dissecting the question of whether I should ask someone at the museum if I could see the name so I would know what to call this dead man. I never did. My curiosity felt vulgar. My first two stops would keep the apathy at bay, and the third would provide quick respite before the crematorium. I would go out for cigarettes. The questions would differ throughout the year, the comparisons that would be made by the tourists would update with a new cycle, but one thing stayed constant during my Terezin tours. If there was a crowd, if I was spending my morning with more than a private group, there was always another smoker. Through long nights debating with my colleagues, we decided that there had to be a higher statistical probability of a death drive for those who spent their mornings on concentration camp tours. Most days, I would manage most of my cigarettes alone. I'd check my messages to make sure I wasn't scheduled for an old town tour the moment we got off the bus in Prague, and I'd catch up on whatever social engagements or news stories that were taking up space in the back of my head. Sometimes. That would be it. I'd have a quiet cigarette, check my phone, go back inside the museum to gather everyone up, and then the rest of the tour would be a blur. But those are not the cigarettes that are haunting me right now. They'd come out of the museum. The Dutch, the Italians, the Mexicans, the Brits, they'd walk out of the museum and light up and eventually we'd get to talking. The moms, the retirees, the college backpackers, the way we'd end up at the question would differ, but the question was always the same. The black, the white, the straight, the gay, they would all ask a single, simple question. Will we ever learn? I always try to be optimistic. Faith in mankind is a good morale booster, and I would hate to sit with the thought of the alternative on an hour-long microbus ride. Some would be optimistic with me, but their optimism, much like mine, was hollow. We might have said otherwise, but our chats were a silent reaffirmation. The wheel would turn, and all the victories that we win are temporary. After two years of not setting foot in the camp, I have found myself thinking about that question again. A mosaic of humanity sucking in nicotine on the street where the starving once roamed, asking whether it's cursed to repeat its mistakes, only to announce it will never happen again. The wheel keeps on spinning in plain view when we quietly smoke our cigarettes and half-heartedly say that it stopped still decades ago. Those memories of Terezin were buried beneath the haze of 2020 and I discounted them as a job I would never do again. For the past three weeks, however, that park, those people, that question, it has all stolen sleep from me. I was born Czech, but my father traveled for work. I spent a brief four years here as a child, but all my memories of Prague are all from adulthood. When I was a toddler, we moved to Kazakhstan. All I remember is the cold and the towering gray blocks of cement. What Kazakhstan was in 1994 compared to what it became over the decades of shedding the Soviet rule, however, is magnificent. The people built up and they said never again, and then, after a temporary victory, the wheel turned once more. From 9 until 14, I lived in Pakistan. I remember well the heat, the unease, that ever-present caravan of army cars on my way to school, 
If I could choose a different place to confront that terrible run-up to puberty, I would have preferred it. But the blasts and the beggars and the evenings of Pizza Hut and houses full of lizards and friends will always stay with me. When the first McDonald's opened in Islamabad, people bought tickets to enter. Those golden arches, as dirty and as crooked as they truly are, were a symbol of something greater. Somewhere beyond, too far beyond to see, but close enough to taste, there was a place where the wheel had stopped. A possibility, a promise, that somewhere across the hills the people said never again and they meant it and their victory was permanent. I never ate in that McDonald's. It wasn't deemed safe. The final leg of my childhood, those mythical years of high school exams and crossing of thresholds I spent in Estonia. Freedom. There were no bombs or earthquakes or transports of troops, no cafes blown apart or stores of DVDs burning. There were malls and parks and basement pubs where the light was dim enough to look old. It was the time of moments which matter little now, but meant the world when they did. All of us were young enough to be born into freedom, but we all came from similar blood. Once upon a time, Gorbachev acted in a pizza hut ad, and the story of how that came to be would always be our birthright. Our parents lived through hell, our grandparents lived through so much worse. Over vodka and juice, we would swap our ancestral heritage, the Estonians, the Poles, the Germans, the Czechs. We'd share tales of the rotation of the wheel and how lives were lived beneath its terrible weights and how it can never happen again. Those crooked, dirty arches, the promise of that vague European West that our parents pried from the jaws of a failing empire. As bad as things were before, there were enough people that said never again, and now things would be good. Thank God that ended. Sometimes that would be the end of the conversation. Sometimes we would carry on and drink and not let history give us anything but a sense of unearned pride, but sometimes. With those of my peers that held their ancestry close to their hearts, I would get a response that would make me feel uneasy. No, it's not over, they would say. Look, they would say. Off in the east, the Botox Zara had missiles and they were pointed at what he considered ancestral lands. The propaganda machine spun, the west hemmed and hawed, and the wheel kept on turning. On the good days, I'd argue that man will learn. We had said never again before, and we said it with enough resolve, and we knit humanity close enough that this time, that this time, at least in this particular corner of our little world, we meant it. On the bad days, the conversation would drop, and we would just continue getting drunk. We were, after all, living in the same states of temporary victory. It would be a sin not to make merry. In 2013, I was back in Prague and I drank for a living, working as a pop crawl tour guide for more nights a week than I would care to remember. In the high season, we would get a hundred or so travelers that we would fill with liquor and then pull through the tourist-occupied bars. There was always at least one drunk Brazilian. In one year of drunken work, there was always a Brazilian, but the geography of the rest of our clientele varied from everywhere around our little world. Each and every continent, with the exception of the Eskimos, sent their youngest and drunkest to the Golden City so that they could prove just how much beer they can drink. It was a good place to forget and go numb about the stories on the news. Most of those nights were spent in drunken giggles or scouting for cops, but as the hedonism became mundane, the dread started to set in. Tourists, almost always Americans, would ask about Russia after a couple of drinks. On the good days, I'd get into the weeds with them and explain the situation to the best of my abilities. On the bad days, and when one drinks for a living, most days are bad, I just tell them the lie that politics don't belong in the pub, and we drink. 
we drink and the stories in the news would become worse and the experts on the television which were rarely wrong would come back with dire predictions and that feeling that we're living at the end of a golden age would spread and we would drink and ignore and forget. I am no stranger to history, and I certainly am no stranger to the history of my people. In 1938, Adolf Hitler occupied the Sudet land under the excuse that there was an oppressed German minority that he was destined to defend. In talks with Britain's Chamberlain, he would scream about hundreds of dead Germans that never lived. He screamed that he wanted peace. He screamed that if Czechoslovakia were no longer a state, the escalating tension of European geopolitics would stop. The West took that gamble. They trusted a man who by all accounts should not have been trusted and for that, for playing that terrible game where the fates of man is decided by what is most convenient, they paid a terrible price. Everyone did. My job and my surroundings provided some buffer from the dread. They allowed me to ignore and forget and make merry in the night and moan about my head at noon. My job and my surroundings shielded me from what was happening in the east, yet the reality of shielding your eyes from a coming threat is that the closer it gets, the more fingers you have to use. Crimea When Crimea started to snake its way into the news, when the experts on the television that are rarely wrong start to explain what our future would look like, I thought, Surely not. Surely the parallels to that horrible war that we promised to never fight again were clear to all. Surely we have learned our lesson that plebiscides are done through the ballot box and not through the barrel of a tank, that warmongers are never full and that the pursuit of power in totalitarian states would always be total and that the price for that hunger would be paid in innocent human lives. Surely, surely Europe would not let history repeat. I remember that moment ever so clearly, and I fear I will remember it until my mind is gone. A deafeningly loud bar, three fingers of the cheapest rum that could exist on a shelf, married with too much ice and communist-era Coca-Cola. My off-season tourist crowd, dancing and kissing and screaming on the dance floor, just a stone's throw away from my lonesome table. I drank that bitter drink and searched for some inkling of hope, but none could be found. Crimea was taken. The Sudetenland crisis played out again nearly 80 years later in colored television and YouTube videos and fiery tweets, and although there were loud voices which spoke their mind, the result was all the same. Strong words on papers that did nothing but provide a green light for the next steps. A realization that when Europe gathered in the rubble after that horrible war and said never shall we let this happen again, we actually stood alone, each nation whispering never shall this happen to me again, with a feathered conviction that we mistook for unity. I remember draining that bitter drink and staring into the ice and shaking it as if it were a magic eight ball that could ease my mind. It did not. It simply reminded me of how cold the Estonian winters were. How there were nights when it hurt to breathe because the air was so cruel. How I stumbled drunkenly through cobbled streets with friends that are the building blocks of who I am today. How. During one of my first romantic trysts, an overzealous Estonian unbuttoned my shirt and gave me a lung infection to remember her by. I remember draining that bitter drink, that bottom shelf apathy and feeling like a fool. I was losing sleep over something I had no say in. I was sitting alone at a bar with a name badge that suggested I was fun and I was moping about the wheel of history that will never stop spinning. I felt naive, forever suggesting, for even hoping, that mankind could learn its lessons and stand united. I remember that empty glass of ice, that roaring crowd of drunken joy and that capitulation. History seemed eerily familiar because it would always repeat. 
All victories were temporary. The wheel would always turn. The only thing that remained was to hold up hope that the wheel would turn slowly. That the Botox Tsar and his ilk would make progress slowly, so that by the time the stories I have heard from my ancestors old and frail would come knocking on my door, I would be just as old and frail as when they gave me my birthright. I hope the wheel will turn slowly, so that others, not me, would have to bear the brunt of its force. The Brazilians were at the bar and they insisted I take shots with them. They approached me as friends and it felt selfish to be sad. It felt selfish to make the despair that gripped me their problem. I could seldom put words to that pain when I was sober and if I tried drunk, all that would come would be tangents and tears. It felt selfish to be sad, so I went and I drank. The shot of tequila, which would make me vomit by sunrise, wasn't just cheap alcohol. It was a toast to a surrender. A retreat into issues that were my own so that my heart would not rely on the stopping of a wheel that would never stop. I remember that moment ever so clearly, and I fear I will remember it until my mind is gone. A promise sealed with a burning throat. I would cover my eyes and carry on and not worry and let the chips fall where they may. The door of the Prague metro is closing. The Botox czar strikes another blow. That is all mundane. What else is new? Tre bling ka. I left the job with a drink and took what I knew of history to make a living. For three hours, for years, for tens of thousands of people, I would boil what I could of our history down into a joke-filled tour. I did not shy away of how eerily similar it all was. A man would have to be blind not to connect the dots. I would argue, rarely, but never without conviction, with the children of the rich that thought history was just a game of numbers and that the wheel would stop, but that it would stop in the exact same position that would allow their parents to pay for more trips to Europe. I argued with them, and I stood my ground, but deep inside I knew that they were right. History was just charts and graphs, and trying to find man among the numbers of the dead was just an act of psychological self-flagellation. A bitter truth found through burning throats, tre, bling, ka. I lost all hope, but I still watched. I scrolled and I scrolled in between repeating the story of the Holocaust and the communist scourge and the Thirty Years' War. I scrolled and I scrolled and I read about the assassinations and the bomb blasts and the shady money slittering its way into mouths that proclaimed to have humanity's best interest at hand. I repeated history over and over again until it was bled of all its colors and all the stories of hope just became dramatic twists that would earn me more tips. The pandemic hit, and the tenor got darker. That huge crushing wheel turning on a schedule of suffering and strife, it wasn't stopped. It wasn't even running slow. We were going through another plague, and I full well know what comes after the plague in the history books. I lost my job. I had faith that it would come back in some form, that I would get to do what I love again, but I promised myself I would never speak in that concentration camp again. I could not stand beneath those gloomy skies and tell people never again. I am not a liar and I don't want to be paid for lies. I would still scream about the Soviets on the streets of Prague while it was still safe to do so and then, if it ever came to it, I would quiet down and do what my blood did in 1968 and try to carve out a life beneath that crushing wheel. Two years of corona wiped most of my memories of the camp. I signed with a company which would recommend, but never lead, tours of Terezin. I would still tell the tourists where to go and what to visit if they asked, but a three-hour tour of a city seldom has time for crimes against man that took place outside of the city streets. Sometimes, after the bars opened and we decided danger was negligible, I would tell stories of Terezin to my friends. Not of the Holocaust, but of the city. 
of the time I bribed the police to hurry along a traffic stop, of the man who loudly asked if Nazis could have created a better world in the middle of my tour, of the time I was put in charge of German tourists because I have a German last name. I never spoke of the four-legged duck or the man with that eerily familiar toothbrush mustache. I never told them of how in the crematorium, ever so quietly, someone would always ask me how the chimneys worked. I never told them of those three notes that were repeated over and over for seconds, for minutes, for hours, until they lost their meaning, tre, bling, ka. We had all lived through the pandemic. Some of us lost more than our jobs. There was no time for darkness. We had to make merry. We had to make merry because our victories are temporary and we all watch the same news. We saw those golden arches off in the distance turn more crooked and dirty than they ever were. We saw the infighting amongst our own getting worse. We saw the power grabs off in the east. We saw and we understood and a part of that understanding was a capitulation of our role in the wheel. I got two years of respite. I got two years where Terezin was nothing but a word to say between cocktails before transposing the horror into stories of human folly. I forgot it could be better. I forgot because whatever cynicism that had gripped my heart said it would never be better. All our victories were temporary and I was living in the twilight of something terrible and there was nothing that I could do but make merry and cherish the time my parents had won me. But then, about three weeks ago, the memories started flooding back. That image of a mosaic of humanity breathing out smoke, asking if we'll ever learn again. That fractured image of man, of Europe, of America, of Africa, of Asia, asking the same question through a united human voice. Asking, knowing that any positive response will be hollow and filled with lies, but asking none the less. Will we ever learn? That specter followed me from my bed to the subway to the beds of others. Never present question, whatever rising stakes. Crimea broke my spirit, Skripal broke my spirit, Verbatyitsa broke my spirit, the Botox czar with his thousand brainwashed mouths taught how to break the will to fight broke my spirit and when a man's spirit is broken, the answers that taught bitter apathy leap easily off the tongue. Will we ever learn? No, now stop asking and shut up. We need to make merry for all our victories are temporary and it's almost midnight. There was comfort in that resignation, an undying confidence that I would never again sit shaking a glass of ice with tears in my eyes, a poisonous comfort that tricks you into thinking you'll never hurt again if you never hope again. I thought Ukraine would surrender much like we did in 38 and 68. I thought the West would bicker and hem and haw and then leave nothing on the table but letters of condolences. I thought that the coming information war with those that spin the wheel would be so brutal that an ordinary citizen, those among us that only make merry and refuse to see the shadows on the wall, would be given no choice but to see the conflict in dark shades of grey. I thought that the wheels of history would keep on spinning and that looking at men as numbers, seeing the blinding suffering which war brings as collateral damage to slowing down the march of boots, I thought that was the only way to stay sane. The League of Nations failed and whatever new promises we made in the rubble would fail again. The war was lost and all there could be hoped for was a slow decline rather than a fast one. I let my shielded heart dictate what reality would become. I ate up that cold gruel served by men without faces and I accepted its implications. Democracy was a smokescreen for those that do not understand power. The West had grown fat and comfortable and would not accept any pain on behalf of others. The Botox czar would lie lie and lie again and much like the lies of his ancestry the lies would rape the truth and make any shared reality impossible i was wrong <laughs>
I underestimated Europe's appetite for democracy. I underestimated how our shared blood ties us together, how a common history unites us in certain unalienable truths, how far we have come in the past 30 years. I underestimated the promises which the blood that courses through my veins made in the rubble after that terrible war. Never again, they all said in unison, holding hands, and then, once they all parted and their speech descended out the realm of mottos and banners to their own native tongue, they said something else. Quietly as to not summon that evil which they had all witnessed. Quietly they said something else. But if there ever is an again, they said, as the children born into freedom started to open their eyes, if there is an again, we will fight like hell. The promise of a continent rebuilt from the rubble by the Marshall Plan, rebuilt with multi-party democracies in the face of totalitarianism and propped up by unalienable rights of man is ringing true. Many have died to bring the promise to life, and many more will, but once the dust settles, once the help has arrived, we will rebuild and shout never again, and then when the rooms are quiet and the liquor has taken off the edge from the superstition, we will whisper the second part of that promise, and will mean it. The idea that it was the Botox czar that united us, that Europe could only come together in the face of a madman who had stopped bothering to lie, is laughable. It's not him that brought us together. Those that drive wedges between man for profit and greed can never bring us together. What united us was the fight. That burning passion of freedom that explodes against ill-fueled trucks. That deafening cry of self-determination that makes Russian troops shake in their boots. That defiant imagination that can see a better world past the numbers and the graphs announcing there will be none. What united us was Ukraine's appetite for the promises that we made. The innocent dying for the ideals that we have championed, that we have let fall into the realm of abstract and debates. That is the fight that has united us. Make no mistake. The fight is not over and more carnage will come. We will suffer defeats and those defeats will shake our faith. Yet that will... That burning ember of hope that things will be better instilled in us by those who saw them be worse. That fire, no matter how bright, will burn the ice from our glasses and warm our hands so they can keep on gripping to the promises we have made. When the war is done and that fire of hope burns blindingly bright, we will warm ourselves in its light and rebuild and say never again and then whisper the second part of that prayer when the liquor is poured. Make no mistake, 30 years have passed since the fall of the Iron Curtain. The Botox czar's doctors might have removed the decades from his face, but there is no surgeon who can cut away our history. We have tasted freedom and the bitterness of the alternative is no longer tenable. The Tsar's position is no longer tenable. We are watching a miscalculation of spirits that will ring true through the history books for hundreds of years. The League of Nations rose from the dead, and even though it hasn't fired a single shot, it has brought the Tsar's kingdoms to its knees. There is a pizza hut in Moscow. Gorbachev once ate in it and recommended others do the same. The Russians have heard the identical promise of cooperation and justice. They too stood in lines when the golden arches rose. They too wanted to taste that freedom. For decades the Tsar has lied and adjusted those promises to make himself seem a king. For decades the tyrant has lied and lied and lied again and we played into those lies because we wanted his money, because we placidly accepted that our ideals are nothing but words said by politicians, but few will die defending the words spoken by suits. Ukraine has showed us that although we might have thoughts, we were speaking in platitudes. We were treading over ideals that are worth dying for. Make no mistake. Nuclear warheads are always armed and loudly announcing the status quo is nothing but the death knell of a tyrant. 
make no mistake, this ends with the tyrant's head on a pike. Slava Ukraine.